Welcome in California, Boston. Um, I apologize if I look a little tired. I just flew in from my uh, TEDx Nashville talk and had to catch a flight and get up at 3.30 in the morning to get here. So, um, so I'd, I'd like to just make one point. I mean, I've spent 25 years in, in clinical oncology, cancer research. I uh, cut my teeth in research down the road at uh, Dana-Farber and, um, and then left, left academics for a period of time to head up uh, translational oncology research at a large pharma. I think this is tremendous because one of the things that, that I actually miss about tackling problems like this um, when I directed a, a large multidisciplinary group um, in industry was the fact that we brought together incredible minds from systems biology, from clinical pharmacology, from toxicology to medicinal combinatorial chemistry, all to uh, you know, bring their expertise to bear on a problem. In that case, it was developing therapeutics. So, you know, I've seen enough in cancer that um, the, the next best thing since sliced bread, it comes, it goes, it was interleukins, it was gamma interferon. Now the big thing are checkpoint inhibitors and immunotherapy, which are transforming the way we treat cancer, but you know, they're limited, unfortunately, in their efficacy. So nothing is ever black and white. It's, it's never that straightforward, sadly. Although I do love the prevention. I mean, for cancer, it's prevention, 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 as opposed to treating things once they're established. Um, <clears throat> you know, precision medicine, we have all the omics you want, you know, metabolomics, proteomics, genomics, salomics, epigenomics, um, they're all there. They're meant to really help guide patient care. They're not really meant to replace clinical judgment. I love the, the talk about who are the stakeholders. I mean, in the midst of, of all of this, short of preventing it, it's, it's always the patients, it's the clinicians. I mean, they're the real stakeholders. It's, it's not, you know, a drug company. It's, um, it's not me. Well, I, am a, I was a patient. Um, so I'm sort of a triple threat, a clinician, a researcher, and a patient of one of the most severe complications of Lyme disease. Um, so, um, so we have a lot of tools. I, I'm going to spend some time on this because I really think this is informative. You know, people talk about Lyme disease outside of this auditorium and outside of the people sitting here like it's no big deal. I mean, I go around, people think that it's like having strep throat. You know, you take some antibiotics, it's gone. Um, I ended up having a heart transplant from the complications of a misdiagnosis and having permanent damage that was not correctable with antibiotic therapy and rather aggressive antibiotics at that. The, the incidents, which to make a point, 300,000, those are the people that are diagnosed based on the strictest criteria that the CDC and others have established, which is based on Western blots. I mean, you know, in cancer, if you said to somebody, we're going to we're going to base our treatment based on a Western blot. I mean, we're beyond Western blots. So, you, you know, you could have, I don't, God only knows how many people out there who have all the symptoms and are missing two bands on a Western blot. They're not counted as part of that 300,000. So, this problem, I mean, I'm, I'm one of the scholars for the Common Foundation for Breast Cancer. By incidence, this is a bigger problem than breast cancer. And there are billions of dollars spent in breast cancer research. Thank God. I mean, we need the research there, too. And I'll show you that the lessons from cancer really can inform the direction we take for this disease. I mean, we shouldn't be living in silos. So first, no one talks about cancer like one disease. That's like 1950-ish, maybe 1960s. I mean, we know that cancer is hundreds to thousands of individual diseases that can be distinguished based on, again, whatever omics you want to choose genomics, proteomics, metabolomics, all of the above to create, you know, a sub-classification of cancer. And in the next, I would say, five years, we're not even going to call cancer based on, you won't call it breast cancer, prostate cancer. It's going to be what the wiring of that tumor cell is. And, and treatments are no longer going to be, that's a breast cancer treatment, or that's a triple negative breast cancer. It's going to be that's a BRAF mutation-driven tumor, and you're going to get a BRAF-targeted approach. I mean, things have rapidly changed. Yet, we still talk about 
Lyme disease, like it's one disease. You know, you got Lyme disease. Well, I mean, what the hell does that mean? I don't know, it's like saying you have cancer. That doesn't mean anything anymore. And so if we, if we talk about it like this is one disease, then we're going to be back to where we were with cancer, which is throwing crap at the wall and hoping it sticks and killing a bunch of people and destroying their microbiome in the case of, of Lyme disease, which has all sorts of consequences, and not really knowing what they're doing. Um, so we can't treat this based on a one-size-fits-all approach. Uh, you'll have to pardon me, but uh, again, I'm so focused on my 18-minute talk yesterday that I can't tell you how neurotic I was. So early versus late. Again, cancer. If you wait until the disease is metastatic, um, you know, forget it. Well, although I'll tell you, I mean, now with, with some of the new approaches, it's not necessarily forget it. Early diagnosis prevention is the best approach to cancer. It's the best approach to Lyme disease. But even with early, again, I'll refer back to, to breast cancer, and this gets back to those 20 to 30 percent of people who, who get treated early and don't get better. You could make a diagnosis of breast cancer at the earliest stages, you know, a centimeter tumor, no big deal, right? The doctor says, bad news, you've got breast cancer, good news is we caught it early. 20 to 30 percent of those women will recur metastatically. Now, it used to be a crapshoot. Now we've got genomic precision medicine tests that can predict at the earliest stages which women and men are more likely to recur, which one of those are the 20 percent who doing a mastectomy or a lumpectomy and radiation is not enough. So I would say, who are the 20 percent that don't do well? How do we predict that? Why, why do we give, I mean, I love the triple antibiotics and all, but there are clearly people who do well with doxycycline. What distinguishes them from the other? Do they not have the roots? Um, I think there's a lot of questions, because we could get into a one-size-fits-all for everyone, and again, like cancer, do a lot of damage um, um, without really understanding what we're doing. Therapeutic resistance. I've spent a great deal of my professional career studying therapeutic resistance to targeted therapies. Targeted therapies, you know, all of these Herceptin, all of the drugs develop against mutations, they're all great until they stop working. And all these drugs at some point stop working. So when I became a patient and I started reading the literature, um, I was shocked that persisters were like a big deal. It's like, of course there must be persisters. I mean, these bacteria, I'm making the analogy that this is sort of the infectious disease equivalent of cancer. Not that Lyme disease causes cancer, at least not that we know of, but that the biology is so similar, it's eerie, and that we should take the lessons that have already been developed in another field, that have moved that, that have propelled that field well beyond where this field is, and admittedly, there's a hell of a lot more money in cancer research than Lyme disease. Um, but we need to take those lessons. We don't need to recreate the wheel all over again. They're, they're all out there. We just need to break down the silos, which is why I'm here, to break it down. Um, we know that, that cancer cells change shape, just like bacteria. EMT, epithelial to mesenchymal transition. When cancer cells going, go from being nice epithelial cells in your breast or your prostate or your liver to now disseminating in your bloodstream and invading other organs, which is what kills people, they change shape. They become resistant to the chemotherapy that can cure your breast cancer in your breast. It doesn't work in your liver. It doesn't work when it's spreading around. And we've studied now the genomics, the proteomics, the metabolomics of what EMT is like to develop a whole new therapeutic approach to targeting that dissemination. I think it's probably going to be, at least in the, the veterinary world, it's the same sort of thing. I mean, you know, it also gets to the other point here, which is metastatic disease. When I was a fellow, whether you got a brain metastasis or a lung was like bad luck. Sorry, you know, it's like flipping a coin. We know that there is method to the madness. Why a tumor cell goes to the brain and not to the lung there's a biologic rationale for that. It's built into that tumor cell, and it's also built into the microenvironment. You know, cancer, and I think Lyme disease, so I'm talking about cancer, but the analogies are the same. You know, we used to think it was bad seed, uh, bad seed, normal soil. 
right? It's like a bad tumor cell in the breast, bad tumor cell in your liver. Now we know it's a bad tumor cell in bad soil. There's fertile soil for that tumor to grow. If there wasn't, that bad seed would die off. Um, I think there's some interesting data, again, from the, from the veterinary world, because we can't do a lot of these studies in people, just like we can't do a lot of the studies that have elucidated biology of cancer in people either, um, that show that there's also probably method to the madness of why I had bad cardiac disease and somebody else had bad arthritis or has CNS disease. That may not just be a random event. It may be dependent upon the strain of the bacteria. It may de be dependent upon the microenvironment and the interaction of the myocardiac tissue and a certain you know, expression of proteins on certain bacteria. I mean, all of these things, um, again, probably don't happen by random accident. And so if we understood that, we could start to target the, the Borrelia in a different way. I mean, I would, I would make the point, and I love Dr. Zhang's work, that you know, just like chemotherapy, we could have screened and developed more chemo and tougher chemo and you know, the atomic bomb of chemo, which we did. We did stem cell transplants. We practically killed, and we did kill a lot of people, by wiping out their entire body and their immune systems with enough chemo. That was like the answer. And it didn't work. It didn't work because these cancers and these bacteria are too darn smart. They figure it out. And we need to be smarter at targeting the Achilles heel. And it may not be another antibiotic. It may be understanding when they change that shape, what sorts of proteins change? What are the real drivers of changing that shape? And can we nail it, just like we've done with cancer? So yeah, I've done that. OK. I'm just I'm going to fly through. So this is actually, this is what cancer patients get now. So you get a biopsy. Now we do liquid biopsy. So here's another dilemma here. Well, you know, the Borrelia hangs out in the tissue. We can't detect it in the blood. People said that 20 years ago about cancer cells. We can't always get a biopsy of a liver med or a brain med. You know, now they're circulating tumor cells. Technologies to d detect rare events have been developed. So you can detect a single tumor cell circulating around the blood. And we've gone from single tumor cells to cell-free DNA. So now you can pick up all sorts of mutations in the blood that are a reservoir of the total mutational load in that patient. So if the liver met has a different genomic profile than the brain met, it all ends up in the blood. So you don't have to do 400 biopsies, which is impractical. You can detect it in the blood. And now we're gone from looking at tissue to looking at single cells, to looking at cell-free DNA to guide patient care. It's the ultimate of precision medicine. Um, you know, and we're doing all sorts of things. You know, the pharmacogenomics, what's the right drug? So cancer care, at least in academic institutions, has become incredibly precision-driven and precise. And I think the same needs to happen with Lyme disease. We can't just say you have Lyme disease, and here's your doxycycline or your doxycycline and your ceftriaxone. We have to know a lot more and be smarter about it. And this stuff really does work. I mean, so this, this is just some of the work that we did. And again, keeping your eye on the prize. For me, in the lab at Duke that I, that I run, it's always about what can we do to patients. The science is great. If you can make nice publications, that's wonderful. But if it doesn't impact a patient, who cares? Um, so anyway, so translational science works. You can make observations in the clinic. You can model it in the lab. You go back. It's, a, it's an iterative process until you get it right. The genome of Borrelia is known, at least some of the strains. What are the targets in there that we could take advantage of, just like you know, for cancer? Again, it's not just the bacteria, perhaps. It's the microenvironment that's supporting the bacteria. Um, I think this point has already been made. So my top priorities, um, you know what? They're my priorities. I'm here to hear what you think. Um, so that's why I'm here. That's why I sort of woke up at you know, 3 in the morning, crawled out of bed um, to come here, in addition to being with Nev, who's great. So, um, so I think we need a lot of things. We need better diagnostics. We need to know. We need to develop precision care for patients. We need to have prevention strategies, which make sense. Um, 
And I'll just end on that. That was, uh, that was me in the ICU. I went from, this is a, a fun weekend for me because I ran Boston marathons while I lived in Boston. And I went from running marathons to ending up 72 hours from death without a heart transplant. I mean, I did everything right. Never smoked, did all the right things. Um, a little too stressed while I worked at the Farber. Um, but I did everything right and got bit by a tick and never had a rash, and never had the classic things and was missing a band on a blot but had all the other brain fog and all the other things that people said, oh, you're just stressed out, it's really nothing, don't worry about it. And I ended up requiring a transplant, but it's a happy ending. I'm not running marathons anymore because my wife told me that uh, one body replacement is enough and <laughs> I don't need knees and hips. But I do run half marathons, and that was uh, last April at the Raleigh Rock and Roll Half Marathon. So anyway, I'm here. I'm looking forward to working with you, answering questions, and hearing what the output is. So thank you. Mm -hmm.